And you mentioned that your work was interrupted by your naval service in World War II. It sounded like you gained some very valuable experience there that served you well later on in your professional career. Tell well, us more about that experience. One of my assignments uh, uh, after I went to uh, naval boot camp and uh, learned uh, what we call rocks and shoals, the Navy regulations and whatnot, uh, we were assigned. And because of my uh, engineering experience, my first assignment was to the Douglas Aircraft Plant in El Segundo, California. And their problem was that they had uh, uh, a boneyard of over a hundred airplanes, all with missing parts or with some problems. And so how do we get these to the battlefield instead of in the boneyard? Uh, so they assigned a, uh, an, a group of uh, naval officers working with Douglas Aircraft Plant to try to solve these. Uh, we had a problem, it, it just occurred to me, uh, in the assembly of the landing gear. And it was always behind. It was uh, 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 about 90% of the employees were black. And uh, uh, a lot of them felt it was because black uh, employees didn't work as, so hard. Well, uh, I felt that was baloney. And uh, so I talked to them, I looked around and uh, they had several different supervisors. I said, these, you got mostly black employees. Why don't we pick one of these guys and make him the supervisor of the group? And uh, we did. And uh, before long, that outfit was producing about twice as, as much as it was before. And uh, that was just an example of, of people's solution rather than technical solutions. You know, I think 100% of the problems in this world are caused by people, <laughs> not by machines, by, by breakdowns, by, but behind everyone, there's a person. And that's why uh, the people end of it uh, appealed to me so much. Back to these employee uh, participation. Uh, there was a couple of things and I, I didn't start either one of these, but uh, we had a, a division that made wire rope, you know, wire cable. And the general foreman of that, and Charlie Romani, uh, he was a real people guy. And he, he got employee interest. And he had probably the best housekeeping of any wire rope mill in the, in the country. And he, he got the employees to take a personal interest in what they were doing in, in their workplace. For instance, uh, these different machines would work around the clock. So, uh, when a, an employee came in uh, for his shift, he put his name tag on a thing that says, this machine is operated uh, by Joe Jokes. And uh, so at the end of the day, he takes that down. The next guy comes in, he puts it on there. So you, you put a face in with a machine. And then these guys uh, would show pride in what they were doing. And so he got them that when there'd be a breakdown or a delay, instead of them just sitting on their rumps like they do in most places, he got them to clean up around the place, clean the excess oil off the machine, wipe this down. So 
that the workplace, he could be proud of it and not be just uh, all that dirt. And uh, it was amazing how that department worked. They, they all had this, this pride and Charlie did a real great job. Uh, later on, uh, when I was in charge uh, of a number of steel plants, one of which was Homestead Works, uh, we had a, a huge machine shop. Uh, uh, and uh, because uh, there were about three or four steel plants in the area, instead of investing uh, for expensive machinery in each plant, we, we call this the big shop and they would provide the mechanical services for the other uh, uh, steel plants that are uh, U.S. steel plants that were in the area. And uh, the guy that ran that, his name was, name was Steve Simcoe. He was an amazing guy. He uh, uh, came up uh, through the ranks. He did not have a college education, but he, he had the feel uh, for performance. And uh, he had a committee of wage earners who uh, would select the uh, worker of the month uh, for what they did. And they would pick this guy. This became s such a, uh, uh, a recognition effort that uh, when the people would get this appointment, they would invite their families to come over and they, and uh, I've had some of these people actually cry from the, the emotion of being selected as the uh, craftsman uh, of the month. And uh, that was Steve, that's the way he, he ran this place. It's interesting, later on, uh, in the modernization program, uh, there was a bunch of new uh, uh, computer operated mach machines that were bought and they wanted to pick a superintendent for the shop. And uh, uh, they looked around and the, the general superintendent of the steel plant said, well, here are the names of the guys that we want to pick, but uh, they're all college graduates except uh, Steve. And uh, I, I didn't put his name down because I think I'd be criticized by upper management for, for uh, not having a technically trained guy for uh, uh, with all this uh, high tech equipment. And uh, <laughs> we talked it over and I said, well, uh, uh, is, is he going to do all this programming himself? No, we're going to have guys that are going to do this. I said, well, who's going to get the best performance out of the people, even if the, he doesn't have a college degree? Well, I think Steve would. I said, well, let's pick him. And that we did. And sure enough, I mean, he inherited this high tech stuff and uh, he, he delegated and uh, learned as he went along and uh, ran it. So it's there again, it's, uh, uh, you don't, uh, sometimes we overstress uh, a college degree. It's a, it's a great thing, and on the resume, it, it's super, but uh, it's the performance that counts. And uh, I think uh, if uh, a fellow has a college a technical degree and, and has performance besides, it's going to be pretty hard to beat. But uh, it's what he, you put into that job. And, uh, and uh, so we, we've had in our 
promotional program, not just a, a college degree, but we left openings for people like Steve, who, who could uh, uh, learn a lot of the uh, managerial things uh, because of their leadership. George, what are some of the other highlights and challenges during your career at U.S. Steel? Steel making is a very extensive uh, uh, process. And uh, uh, knowing all the operations are born. This is where the iron and steel engineers uh, that I uh, have been a lifelong member of uh, was very helpful because it provided background to a lot of these things. Uh, when I, I started in a uh, finishing operation uh, of this new modern plant, and then when I got sent to uh, Geneva to so-called straighten it out, uh, I realized I really didn't know those operations. So uh, I uh, started a, a self-conducted training program. Every uh, uh, Saturday afternoon and Sunday, uh, while my family was still in California, I would put on uh, work clothes and uh, assign myself to one of the departments, like say the blast furnace department. And uh, I would uh, select uh, or I would uh, ask for uh, the general foreman uh, to be my teacher for that day. At first, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of misgivings in what I was doing. And also, uh, I didn't want uh, the general foreman's uh, uh, boss to feel that I was uh, uh, spying on him or finding. And uh, once they understood that I was sincere in wanting to learn uh, how that operation worked, uh, I got very good. Uh, cooperation from the people. In fact, a couple of times, uh, the wife of the general foreman, knowing I was coming over, would fix an extra sandwich for me <laughs> while I was uh, en route with him. But uh, uh, it, it gave the general foreman a chance to uh, uh, to show what, what he knows about it and also to uh, learn from me about the broader picture. And uh, uh, so uh, every week I went to a, a different operation and they got used to the idea that I was doing it. And even though I was the boss, uh, I was just a student during that time, uh, learning what the problems are, what, what they were involved. And that was extremely valuable to me because it, it gave me, so that was one of the challenges. Uh, I, I did uh, uh, special uh, uh, assignments from the AISC and their articles and whatnot that, that were helpful. And uh, uh, that was one of the big challenges. And when I went to Gary, there were still uh, new facilities but uh, I didn't have the self-conducted program there. I, I was picking it up as I went along. The challenge was that, and of course, there was always the competition uh, that's involved, and uh, uh, but. The, the real challenge is how do you get performance and workmanship out of your people? 
and I ran into that problem at Gary. It, uh, uh, Gary had, uh, uh, even though it was the, uh, the pearl of uh, the industry, it had lots of problems. Uh, racial as, as well as uh, uh, technical. And uh, uh, it was interesting, the political aspects. Uh, uh, Gary was built in 1906, and uh, the town of Gary was built to support the steel mill uh, right at the bottom of Lake Michigan. And uh, uh, so when they built the town, the uh, uh, mayor of the town was selected by U.S. Steel, and he was a Republican. And it was the last Republican that they had at Gary. <laughs> Ever since that time, they were all Democrats. <laughs> and uh, uh, when I came to Gary, uh, the mayor of Gary, his name was Katz. He was uh, not running for re-election, uh, but uh, he decided he was going to try to improve the racial problems in the town because the town of Gary was about 50% uh, black and the other 50% were East Europeans that came over the, that uh, worked the steel mill in those days. And uh, so he, uh, uh, he had uh, a committee uh, uh, for racial improvement and uh, uh, he picked me to be the uh, chairman, to be the management uh, chairman, and uh, uh, a fellow named George Coker, uh, who was of uh, a black uh, from the Urban League, to head the uh, uh, the black section. George Coker turned out to be a wonderful person and a great friend very capable and we worked many things together. So uh, our problem was try to improve uh, the situation. Uh, it was especially true in the city of Gary because uh, uh, there was a housing shortage and uh, uh, there was a lot of unemployable uh, blacks, people who had gotten in jail, who were in trouble, who, uh, and uh, in some cases, there would be six or eight of them uh, that would be living in one room. And uh, uh, how do you solve that problem? Uh, uh, there was a democratic uh, administration in Washington, and they granted a number of requests for modernization uh, of, uh, of the city of Gary. The problem was they couldn't move the people out of these places uh, because there was no, no place for them to go uh, in order to make the modernization. So one of my uh, responsibilities was to try to work with the city of Gary to see what we could do to uh, to take care of the people and to enable the uh, construction of these facilities. And uh, that was one of the challenges. It turned out that uh, I was able to work out a program from U.S. Steel to build 280 apartments uh, uh, financed uh, partially oh for financed on the loan by the US government uh, but uh, 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 that permitted at least that many employees to be moved to these facilities while uh, other parts of the city could be modernized. Anyway, there is a whole program, and uh, if you 
look at uh, in, in the book that I read that we'll cover in a few minutes, uh, it's described in considerable detail what, what we did in, in order to solve that problem. But that, that was one of the, those were really the, the biggest, uh, uh, I guess one, one other problem, uh, a challenge, is that I was a Westerner and uh, in the steel industry, most of the guys are all from the East and they looked upon a lot of us as Indians and uh, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was winning a, a position uh, uh, to move up in spite of the fact that uh, uh, we were, I was from the West. Well, George, you definitely t tackled those challenges going back to your football career. That's something you do great, tackling challenges. So I also read that in your retirement, you worked as a consultant. How did you like that experience? Yes, that was very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> it was very low key. And... Uh, uh, it involved, oddly enough, people. <laughs> it was finding people uh, for for some operation that they needed, and through my experience and uh, uh, through uh, being national president of the uh, Association of Iron and Steel Engineers, it was called in those days, and. Uh, through other assignments I had, I got to uh, know a, a lot of people in the steel industry all over. And I was able to suggest uh, uh, people uh, that would be experts in fields for. Uh, I also helped uh, uh, various like Kaiser engineers to get business by uh, contacting. Uh, uh, people that I knew. One of my more unusual experiences was to be a consultant for the Southern Pacific Railroad Company. And uh, 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 what happened there is that uh, uh, there was a downturn and uh, Southern Pacific uh, had to cut costs. So they retired early a number of, of uh, executives and uh, cut down on maintenance and, and other items. Well, lo and behold, suddenly there was a big pickup in business and they couldn't face it. And they had let their head of their maintenance go and they had all these locomotives and uh, they weren't... Uh, fit to be operated and they had to select a someone to hit it well they had employed an engineer uh, in their, who was an excellent engineer in the railroad and but he had, had no management experience whatsoever and uh, so ben biagini the chairman called me in and said i want you to take uh, Mr. Burns here and uh, work with him and see if he he can handle that job and then come in and tell me. And I said, well, I can't help him and spy on him at the same time. <laughs> you let me work with him and if he can't do it, he'll come in and tell you that he can't do it. I'm not gonna do it. And uh, he said, okay. so." Uh, I worked with this guy who was working day and night trying to to, to get these problems solved. And uh, uh, my first challenge was to convince him I was not trying to get his job or to spy on him. I was there to help him. And uh, two is that he was so busy himself that uh, I was mindful of taking up his time when he didn't have any time anyway. But gradually, uh, I worked with him 
and uh, uh, he was a very bright guy. And uh, uh, <laughs> he used me for a sounding board. And he'd say, you know, I've got this meeting coming on and uh, uh, I had a couple of ideas, but uh, I don't want to be left out of it because they're different. And uh, 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 what do you think? I said, well, let's discuss it. Uh, if you're going to take a risk, then you got to look at your fallout position, plan B. And the bigger the risk, the better that plan better be. And then you, Absolutely. Then you can fall back on it. So uh, let's discuss that. So we, so that's kind of how I work with him, and uh, he became more confident and uh, was able to uh, really impress Biagini, the uh, chairman. Throughout, there are about four or five of them. And so uh, uh, I worked with them to improve their productivity. Well, a couple of them were, were new in their jobs that they didn't know. So uh, I kind of helped them along this thing. Uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, I mentioned this Steve Simcoe uh, in Homestead, Pennsylvania. And uh, I got a hold of Steve. I said, Steve, I got three guys who uh, who need some of your background. Would you talk to them? And so we I got permission all the way around and uh, uh, and uh, Steve's uh, department head uh, uh, was an employee of mine. He, so he knew me and he he went out of his way. And uh, so we flew these guys over to uh, Homestead, and Homestead put on a real show of uh, of how they they get employees motivated to work on it. And uh, uh, so we went along that way, uh, <laughs> and uh, the chairman was pretty pleased. But uh, uh, we had a problem uh, between. Uh, 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 what we call the production department and the sales department of uh, uh, of what uh, Southern Pacific could take on and what the production department could could perform, and instead of uh, snapping at each other and putting the finger on each other, what can we do to get them to work together and, with a plan? that uh, would uh, improve the performance of Southern Pacific and uh, uh, run the place more economically. So uh, uh, I worked uh, uh, with them. <laughs> it was interesting. At one point, uh, there were loggerheads at a, uh, at a compromised position, and Biagini, it called uh, a number of these guys in and called me in, outsider. He says, I'm sending you over to the uh, John uh, Hopkins uh, Hotel, nice hotel in, uh, in San Francisco, and you guys are going to stay in there until you come out with a plan. You're not going to leave. You're going to stay there until you get this resolved. And he said, George, I want you to go with him. <laughs> oh, gosh, here I am, you know, an outsider. But uh, at the same time, I had independence that others didn't have. And uh, we were having these meetings, and uh, I listened, and pretty soon I, I hit the table, and, and I told these department heads, I said, you guys are just going around. Uh, loggerheads, you got to solve this problem and quit holding your position. You have to change it in order to make it go. And uh, 
we did that. So I, I had a number of assignments like that with the Southern Pacific Company, which are all different. And I got paid for it. And it was fun. <laughs> so, Excellent. Uh, yeah. But there's a lot of other experiences, uh, too many to, to cover. But, uh, uh, but most of them involved uh, finding a, a top executive for, for something. Uh, uh, there was a steel plant there in the Bay Area and they needed uh, some knowledge and uh, uh, the guy that used to be my assistant at, uh, at uh, Geneva while I was doing all this, he did all the technical stuff. I couldn't have gotten along without Carl. He was excellent. He, at first, when I moved up, he thought he should have the job, uh, but uh, uh, he was a great guy and uh, he, uh, uh, we developed a wonderful working relationship. And uh, so this uh, opening came up as vice president of operations. So I said, well, why don't you pick Carl? He's available. And so he got the job and uh, he did an excellent job for them. So there was a, a lot of personal uh, things like this. Uh, I used to laugh and say, you know, this is a great job. I, uh, uh, I make a lot of recommendations uh, that uh, I would have made to my uh, employees and they ignored them. Whereas here, these guys are paying me and they're going ahead and doing it. I said, that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. It was just a joke. But uh, <laughs> amazing, I, I really enjoyed it. But uh, uh, and you could kind of go your own pace. I uh, I made a list the other day. I think I had twenty five different uh, companies that I did a little bit or quite a bit of consulting for. So th th that was uh, interesting. But then uh, I developed cancer and I had to stop that activity because I wasn't able to do it until I got over it. But that's all in the book. You can read about the details of that. Mm hmm definitely. So, George, I know for your long and very exciting career that you were able to travel to many countries and that your wife, Barbara, was sometimes able to accompany you. What is one of your favorite travel memories? Oh, gosh, we made so many. You know, actually, uh, I found China uh, just uh, fascinating. I, I got to see the uh, uh, the big dam that was built, the world's biggest, and I got to see that uh, uh, as they started, and then uh, uh, got to see it uh, some six years later when it was uh, almost finished, and the uh, uh, the big lake that was formed behind the dam was, was uh, about two thirds along. That was a tremendous project, but the whole, whole experience through China was very interesting. Uh, I, I kind of looked over the list and uh, I think I made about a hundred trips altogether. Uh, Barbara went with me, uh, oh, maybe on four or five of these. And then we went, uh, after I was uh, retired, uh, she went uh, on a lot of trips with me, but we, we traveled almost uh, everywhere uh, and uh, enjoyed it very much. Wonderful. Now, what milestones in the industry do you think have had the biggest impact on the industry over the years? 
Oh, I think computers uh, probably as much as anything. And uh, uh, I think there's been a lot more scientific uh, applications given to the steel industry, uh, which uh, has uh, uh, just uh, uh, jolted it up uh, in performance. And uh, see, I still have my my little. Uh, I I'm phone. I've got an iPad. I've got this uh, 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 iMac that I'm working with. Uh, <laughs> there aren't too many people my age that do that. I, I was going to say you are by far the most tech savvy 103 year old uh, uh, I know. I have a couple of grandkids that really help me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Now, George, I read that you were recognized by Stanford with the prestigious Stanford Medal. Why is this the award you are the most proud of? Because uh, Stanford had provided me with so many things that I did not have. Uh, I've been so anxious to try to pay Stanford back for all it has done for me and try to make the same kind of opportunity available to others who perhaps would not have a chance to participate. Stanford has a wonderful program of need blind, which means uh, in spite of the fact that there are about six or eight applications, applicants for everyone that's accepted. Um, the financial ability to pay is not important. And uh, uh, depending on the person's, if the person is qualified, uh, the payment of the tuition and and education uh, depends on the family's ability to pay. And if it's no uh, finance available at all, uh, that applicant will get a complete scholarship. So uh, it's a wonderful, it wasn't quite that easy when I went through, but uh, I've worked on, uh, on some 75 years of uh, volunteer service for Stanford uh, 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 in gratitude for the opportunity it gave me. And uh, uh, I received the Stanford Medal, which goes to three people a year uh, for uh, uh, exceptional volunteer activity uh, to help the school. And uh, I was very proud of that. And uh, uh, it builds for the future. I, I've helped uh, set up uh, uh, scholarships and fellowships in both the graduate school and in engineering. And then Barbara and I have uh, established a scholarship in engineering and one in the graduate school of business. Uh, uh, I wish I could do more, but uh, uh, that, that's one of the uh, uh, awards that uh, mean the most to me. Uh, wow, you have made such incredible contributions to the Stanford community. Well, look what Stanford has done for me. Exactly, <laughs> two-way street. Mm-hmm. 
I have uh, placards all over my, I have a room for the trophies and placards and, uh, you know, it's for services with the, for the Boy Scouts or for the Chamber of Commerce or, or you know, those things from uh, the different cities that I lived in. Uh, but uh, one of the things that, that has always uh, uh, appealed to me was trying to pay Stanford back for the wonderful opportunity it gave me. I mean, it, it gave me an education. It gave me a wife that uh, was an extremely important part of life. We, we were married for a little over 74 years. And uh, she was uh, my, uh, uh, my strongest supporter, uh, strongest backer. Uh, her personality is entirely different from mine. It's a good thing, uh, but she kept a, a stable home. You know, uh, when my folks separated when I was 11, I was determined that uh, that wasn't gonna happen to me. And uh, so Barbara and I uh, developed this relationship of the important thing is us, not you or me, us. So we try to talk things out and try to decide which one had to maybe give in a little bit uh, so that us was the important thing. And uh, uh, we followed that pattern and uh, uh, Barbara created just a wonderful home for me. And uh, much of my success was uh, was uh, uh, the result of of having peace and, and love at home and support. And uh, uh, Barbara also had a very uh, keen sense of uh, honesty and uh, uh, fairness. And uh, I would, she wouldn't tell me what to do, but if I asked her for what she thought about something, she would give me an opinion, which was always good. And uh, uh, that's where we lived. Uh, uh, I think being happy in my uh, married life, uh, we had no children of our own. We took risks, we adopted two kids. Uh, before they were born, we were willing to take the risks and uh, turn out to be one of the best decisions we ever made. Have a wonderful son and a wonderful daughter. But uh, we solved that problem together and we solved many problems together. And uh, uh, I lost her uh, just two years ago. But, uh, you know, I'm so grateful for the wonderful life that she gave me and, the, and our relationship that, uh, uh, you know, I can't feel any other way, just that I'm grateful for something that very few other people uh, have enjoyed. I think one of the important things in life is is to be grateful for what you got. And uh, I'm also always so thankful for any hope that's given to me. And I appreciate and I try to repay in kind. And uh, uh, it's part of living. And uh, the important thing in life is to be happy. And you can't be happy unless you're positive and uh, you're uh, uh, 
willing to uh, discipline yourself to look at the good things that you have and not be overburdened by all the problems that you have. Uh, look at problems as opportunities. You know, uh, uh, if a problem comes along, get the joy of solving that problem rather than letting it uh, throw you for a loop. And uh, stay positive in what you're doing. And uh, uh, that, that that's part of living. You know, people say uh, uh, throughout your life, you've been granted a lot of promotions. How do you get promoted? And uh, I just took the step early in the game saying that regardless of what job you have, do it to the very best of your ability. Try to do it better than what anyone else will do. And at the same time, try to learn, grow, and then look at the next job and try to prepare yourself for it. But only after you have tried to fulfill all the responsibilities with a job. You know, even a job as a foreman, say, okay, he's got 20 employees. That's not much of a job. There's 20 lives that are dependent on how you manage your job in leadership, their own uh, uh, welfare, their happiness, uh, their job satisfaction uh, depends on how you conduct yourself and then uh, try to use that philosophy uh, all the way up. And uh, uh, you, you've got to be honest with yourself. You don't deserve the job unless you earn it. And you don't earn it unless you have the performance. So that's that's my advice to anyone who wants to go up. Don't just look at the job ahead of you. Look at what you got now. Are you doing that to the best of your ability? And then responsibility is awesome. Fulfill it first. Great piece of advice. Now, I understand you're a life member of AIST, having joined its precursor, AISE. Why should young professionals in the industry also become members? Well, I think it's the foremost uh, technical association uh, that can provide uh, knowledge and training to people, you've got to, uh, learning has to be a lifelong pr uh, process. You don't uh, just go to school and then that's the end. You've got to learn on your life. I, I try to study, learn, even now at this age, what am I going to do with that knowledge? Well, you got to, you got to keep it up. And you got to stay active. And uh, uh, AIST, which it is now, uh, is a great organization uh, to uh, to help you technically, and also to get to know people in the, in the business. And uh, 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 you know, as you have contacts and you have a problem, then you can feel free to call that person for for help or advice at the same time you got to make yourself available to help someone else who needs it that's what makes the world go wrong so uh, 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 I, I think it's a, a great organization for that sense 
Absolutely. As a young professional involved with AIST and also an avid skier, uh, George, we have a lot in common. So what has been one of your favorite ski memories? Deep powder skiing is what I love. Uh, physically, it's a little tough to handle now, but uh, I love the powder. And uh, uh, But there's also the association, the fresh air. Uh, I remember when the kids were little, uh, I'd, I'd take them up on the chairlift. And uh, it's amazing how on a, on a beautiful day with a purple blue sky uh, and the uh, snow around, fresh air, how suddenly they start talking or at other times you can't get a, a conversation out of them. And uh, it, it just brings a, around the closeness. Uh, and I, I think uh, some are Best discussions have been on on the chairlift going up uh, on the ride, but uh, uh, skiing. Uh, well, how do you feel about skiing? I said, well, I love it. To me, skiing is uh, is like dessert. Uh, after you've had a, a good dinner then the dessert is great. But to live just on dessert, I can't see that. Uh, there's too much in life to, uh, to just devote it all to skiing, uh, at least in my opinion. You've got to stay busy. You've got to utilize the uh, talents that the good Lord gave you. Uh, you've got to do something that uh, for which you're proud. Uh, uh, th those are all uh, the main course. And then uh, have a dessert afterwards, uh, like skiing uh, makes it uh, a complete life. And uh, that's how I feel about skiing. And it's uh, served me that way now for some 55 years. I love it. Wow, George, like you, I love skiing and I also loved reading your book. There were so many valuable lessons in there and great stories. So I highly recommend that everyone take the time to read it after watching this oral history interview. Now, are there any stories that you would like to share with us now or any other philosophical observations? I think it's very important to live your life constructively, to make use of your talents uh, and maintain a positive, uh, optimistic uh, viewpoint. You know, there are problems that develop, unexpected things happen, and uh, sometimes uh, those overwhelm us, but we lose sight of all the pluses that we have. And I think it's very important, and this takes self-discipline on your part, to look at, at the good things you have and compare it with the problems. And you'll find that, uh, uh, you have a lot of needless worry and uh, uh, unhappiness uh, from overstressing the negative. Uh, you know, uh, a glass is half full or half empty, but it's still the same amount. And it costs you the same to be happy as it does to be unhappy. And uh, don't don't let the uh, uh, negative. I think part of living happily 
is to overcome the fears uh, and the uh, bitterness that comes from from problems. And uh, I think that has a a very definite aging effect on you. Uh, do the best you can. Be satisfied with what you're trying, and uh, uh, let let that be the plus sign to be happy in your life, rather than uh, just a, another problem. Uh, I've been fortunate uh, uh, to uh, maintain a, a positive, a progressive attitude all my life. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, it has helped me uh, in my longevity. And uh, I also uh, uh, believe you have to have a lifestyle where you uh, where you exercise moderation in your food in your in your drink in uh, uh, your various act activities uh, I maintain that uh, part of my success is an exercise program that I started uh, uh, some 36 years ago. I tried to exercise every single day for from 45 minutes to maybe an hour and a half every day. Uh, knowing the problems of maintaining a rigid schedule, I uh, uh, try to do my exercise before breakfast uh, so that uh, uh, the interruptions that come up won't deprive you of, of the habit that you have. So if you, if you do your exercise and then go ahead and have breakfast, uh, it's a habit that you can maintain. And there are times when you just don't feel like it. Well, don't let yourself talk yourself out of what you know you got to do. You got to do that exercise. And uh, I think that has helped me a lot uh, mentally and uh, uh, spiritually. But the main thing, stay happy. Excellent advice. And George, thank you. You've shared so many amazing pieces of advice with us, and you've had such a truly incredible career and life story. And as a young professional and avid skier, it was an absolute pleasure to be able to spend this time with you for your interview. So thank you very much again for your kind willingness to share your story with AIME. Surely, thank you so much.